Hey everyone, Donovan Brown here. Welcome to Open Azure Day. Microsoft Azure is the trusted open and hybrid cloud where we offer flexible options for our customers to run any application for their Linux and open source workloads. Our approach is to be open and collaborative and to work with all the partners in the Linux ecosystem. We contribute upstream to the ecosystem to enable our customers with their cloud adoption and open source implementation. Today, we'll be discussing some of the most common questions we get from our customers as they migrate to the cloud. We will hear from our Linux distribution partners and see how they address these challenges and provide our mutual customers with a smooth onboarding and operating experience on Azure. Let's start with our friends from Red Hat. We have Stephanie Chilris, Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Red Hat Linux Enterprise Linux Business Unit joining us today. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Donovan. It's great to be here. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You so much. We know that Red Hat has a long history with Microsoft, and we have jointly developed many solutions running on Azure, from Rail to Azure Red Hat OpenShift. Could you share the technical trends you have observed when customers are starting their migration and operating in the cloud? Sure, absolutely. I think let's start with all the things that are changing. Really, there's so many more options today, and they're constantly growing. I think the word hybrid, which used to mean just on-prem or off-prem, now that term hybrid can really apply to multiple levels in the stack. The choice of where to run, of course, on-prem and off-prem still underpin that, but now you have options like managed services, you have the edge coming in, so those options are growing. You also have different options of how you run. Do you want to run bare metal, virtual machines? Do you want to run on a containerized or microservices or even cloud native? And across all of that as well, now you really need to decide what to run. So a DevOps environment where you can predictably create new applications, be able to turn that on in production, do it quickly, that's never been more important. And with all of these changes and options, of course, Equally important is the things that don't change. You still have to be able to do this reliably with resiliency and for sure securely and at scale. So pulling together things like your management and automation practice, that is critically important as well. All of this comes together to really underpin what we view as our our open hybrid cloud strategy at Red Hat. It's all about flexibility and choice, flexibility and choice with what you run today, but also with whatever you wanna to run tomorrow. It builds upon our whole portfolio and then pulls in the ecosystem. Just as you said, the Linux ecosystem is critically important. It's what brings the flexibility and choice. So those partnerships, they are essential, like our partnership that we have with Microsoft, of course. Awesome. The there's a lot of different strategies and roadmaps that our, that our partners are coming up with. Can you share some of yours that are helping drive our customers to a successful implementation on Azure? So we have certainly been partners for a long time, for over a decade now. And I think the strength of that partnership is because we're able to work both jointly engineering in the upstream, but also together as companies. And we've worked through really having collaborative support models. That allows us to provide a really integrated and interoperable experience for our customers. And they are, at the end, our joint customers. And we can deliver to them with trust that will both be focused on their needs. And as we have looked at the engineering collaboration, we focused on a few things um, that are be kind of become core of what we want to offer together. And that is security, manageability, performance. And that allows us to deliver things that are differentiated both on-prem, but certainly in the Azure cloud. Now, we're consistently collaborating with Microsoft to deliver a more secure and powerful enterprise Linux experience in Azure. This includes support for Microsoft features like Azure disk encryption and Azure role-based access control allowing them to work in tandem with all the advanced features that we put into RHEL security. And we expand that through uh, bringing things in like the library of industry specific security profiles. So that feeds into open SCAP or secure content automation protocols and through via uh, enhancements, right? And key technologies that 
we feel are core to a Linux experience in RHEL. And that's things like security enhanced Linux or commonly termed SE Linux. We've taken this further to workloads like SQL Server on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Microsoft was the first cloud provider to work with Red Hat in order to deliver pre-tuned, ready-to-run images in the Azure marketplace that incorporated RHEL high availability add-ons for SQL Server always on availability. In fact, we have similar capabilities are provided in Azure for Red Hat Enterprise Linux for SAP HANA. So that's really taking that core foundation and building it up into a more workload level experience. We've yeah. also jointly developed Azure Red Hat OpenShift, as you had mentioned earlier. And we deliver that both as a managed service powered by the leading Kubernetes enterprise uh, platform for the enterprise, and that's Red Hat OpenShift. You can choose to deploy that as the managed service, or you can install and manage it yourself on Microsoft Azure. We've now expanded that. In fact, interesting in preview now, we've announced the JBoss Enterprise Application Platform as an Azure app service. So you can now deploy JBoss by yourself in, in Azure, or you can deliver, um, operate it as a managed service. You can do that both on RHEL or on OpenShift. And finally, I mentioned management. Management is key, particularly when you start to bridge this whole hybrid platform. And Red Hat management on Microsoft Azure, that can help you unify everything from your physical, your virtual, and your cloud environments. Azure Arc has enabled support for RHEL, and that allows you to maintain consistent policies. And now Azure Arc has enabled Kubernetes and data services for Red Hat OpenShift that's currently available in preview. So you can see it's kind of the full gambit of what you need to run a hybrid cloud. We're looking at all the aspects of what we can deliver on our portfolio and combining that with the Azure experience. This is awesome. And I, every time I hear SQL Server running on Linux, I just smile. So when you said that, I kind of- <laughs> So do I. Because <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've spun up containers on my machine just so that I could get to a quick SQL Server instance to do some development. And it's made my life so much easier. So uh, it's just, it always makes me smile. It's, it's just a different Microsoft than it used to be. So what advice do you have for customers who are starting their migration into Azure? Do you have any examples of customers who have already done that? So what I have seen is that customers are getting real value in leveraging Microsoft Azure's ability to deliver infrastructure with real agility, along with the flexible, stable, and secure Red Hat portfolio. And we pull this together. One great customer example is Lufthansa Technique. It's a great example because they wanted to lever leverage the infrastructure of Azure to get that real agility to be able to um, leverage Microsoft's expertise in deploying infrastructure exactly when they need it. But they also wanted a fully open source stack. And they were extremely focused on making sure that they had an agile and DevOps approach. And so they chose the Red Hat portfolio. They used Red Hat OpenShift as the foundation. What it allowed them to do was deploy new applications, have them integrate with other applications, and they could also lift and shift as necessary when they wanted to pull workloads from the data center up into Azure. And as they described it, they can now go directly from idea to deploying an application without waiting for infrastructure. And they stated that there's no limit for them with their hybrid strategy, which is just so cool because they can scale with the infrastructure and the platform that we're jointly providing to them. Yeah, it's amazing because when you're talking about Lufthansa and SAP, these are the same customers I go and visit, right? And the stories that we're able to tell as a partnership, it just helps us help our customers. I mean, Satya always says obsess over your customers. And I've taken that to heart. It's not what's good for Donovan. It's not what's good for Microsoft. Yeah. It's what's good for our customers. And it's great to see that you're helping us with those exact same customers. And I think we learned so, so much from them, right? Every customer that we engage with, we learn from them, what they want to do next, where they're going. Deutsche Bank is another perfect example. They were building a new PaaS platform, platform as a service, and they called it Fabric. It ran Red Hat Enterprise Linux in some data centers, but it also ran it in their public cloud deployment in, in Microsoft Azure. Alongside all of that, they ran the OpenShift container platform. They had allowed them to do container and microservices, and both were managed and maintained by Red Hat Ansible Tower. 
it gave them a framework to really automate and standardize their IT at an enterprise scale. This allowed them to shorten their development cycle. What used to take six to nine months now took two to three weeks. Nice. To me, that's amazing. And they also optimized their cost of their data center because they were able to use um, cloud capacity, microservices, containers, and cloud bursting in parallel to their data center. So that's like true flexibility. We were able to combine our core strengths at Red Hat with your core strengths at Microsoft Azure and really give them a sort of a lot of flexible options. Um, so those are the kind of stories that really make me light up, right? This is what ecosystem and partnership really, really brings to customers. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your time today, Stephanie. It has been a lot of fun talking to you and, and just talking about our joint customers that we work with. And I really do look forward to working with more customers together with Red Hat. Yeah, there's so much more to do. Nice to talk with you, Donovan. Thanks for being here. Running business in mission critical applications like SAP and high performance computing is definitely top of mind for many customers. To run these workloads requires deep technical capabilities and fine tuning of the operating system and cloud infrastructure. Providing a secure, scalable cloud for these large applications is key in everything that we do. We're honored to have another partner of ours, Brent Schroeder, CTO of SUSE, to share with us their point of view. Hi, Brent. Hello. Great to be here this afternoon, thank you. Thank you, it's really cool seeing the SUSE Chameleon running some of the largest SAP and high performance computing offerings today on Azure. Can you share how you're helping customers optimize their infrastructure when they migrate large mission critical apps to Azure? Absolutely, uh, you know, if we're gonna break it into three areas, how we like to think about it in the old notion of simplify, modernize and accelerate. And there's practical considerations in, in each aspect of that. You know, starting off from a, the simplification standpoint, you know, somebody shouldn't think necessarily, particularly these biz, large business critical applications, as a simple lift and shift. You know, that might work for some small uh, side applications and so forth. But when you're going to business critical, you, there's really several things that need to be taken into account, uh, such as you know availability zones and how do you set up HA, uh, how are the resource uh, management done? Uh, in the infrastructure. And, and so those aspects we, we think about a lot. You know, and SUSE and Microsoft have worked you know, significantly together uh, for optimization of that, that simplification, automation of the configuration and deployment um, of the infrastructure, the configuration and, and automation in HA. You know, we think those are, are absolutely critical. You know, the most uh, error prone and, and downtime uh, aspects of, of many systems come around manual uh, interactions and human error. And so the more we can automate together, then the better it'll be in that migration and evolving to a cloud model versus uh, the traditional um, on-prem model. Uh, so that's one of the key aspects. And then as, as we modernize you know, and, and move those applications, then we really want to do more integration uh, together with, with how SUSE and Linux uh, work together and tools that and technologies that uh, Microsoft has developed. For example, uh, the Azure Arc uh, mm -hmm. and how Azure Arc works with uh, SUSE Linux in, in providing that holistic view uh, of the Linux estate and, and wherever you're running a mission critical application, you know, tying together very often edge and, and cloud uh, with a mission critical application, capturing that data from the edge, bringing it up to the cloud and being able to see and manage the entire estate uh, through uh, Azure Arc uh, is you know, a great uh, example of some collaboration that we've done you know, that really helps in a mod more modern uh, experience uh, that people are, are delivering and realizing. Uh, and then finally, you know, as we think about accelerating, it's it's how do we help customers deliver faster? They've got it up there, it's stable, it's, it's highly automated. Uh, and now it's how do we scale with agility and helping customers to adopt uh, cloud native computing uh, containers and the things that we're doing together in containers and, and also looking forward in, in how we'll be able to manage uh, large container estates uh, in conjunction with virtual machine estates uh, will you know, help a customer to deploy applications faster, 
uh, be able to manage them as they scale up. Because uh, in, in a container world, you know, it becomes very impractical uh, to manage manually the hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of containers and their interrelationship. So as, as we work together uh, in how uh, customers manage those and continue to build those applications, deploy them, and scale the applications dynamically, uh, you know, that's some of the, the joint work that we'll be doing, uh, you know, as we close uh, some of our transactions in the near future. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and it's just interesting because as Microsoft, we run like 50% of our workloads are Linux. And, and the collaboration that we have with our partners has just been incredible in, in helping us expand that, that landscape. I earlier, I know that Dr. T mentioned that SUSE is trying to be that bridge between the mission-critical applications and Azure. Can you share how you're going to achieve that? Certainly. Uh, it's built upon what I've already started to, to talk about. We've got this notion of the, the bridge being simplify, modernize, and accelerate. And so that it really starts with step one of automation of the infrastructure uh, and, and the, the deployments and the ongoing day two operations, removing as much uh, uh, manual interaction as we possibly can. And that then brings us to step two or phase two in the bridge uh, with modernization. Uh, and with modernization, we want to you know, help customers not just adopt uh, cloud as a modern aspect, but then really starting to move into being able to pick up containers, uh, deploy containers in uh, context of their business critical uh, applications, uh, simplify that that adoption as they move to the cloud and start to scale that. And then the final phase in the bridge is the acceleration uh, and accelerating uh, through the use of, of you know the more modern tools, then also bringing to to the table uh, some of our our acceleration, through insights, you know, as you're able to modern or monitor uh, the infrastructure better, gather more data uh, as to what is going on, uh, and be able to respond much quicker uh, to changes in the environment, to workloads on the system, you know, that'll just help uh, the customer kind of finish off that transition and bridge to a cloud native world. And I like the fact that you're not just sitting on lift and shift because a lot of our customers they, yeah. they really want to get into IaaS, but I, I tell them and I warn like don't get comfortable there. You right. really start to modernize your application and start taking full advantage of the cloud. And I I love IaaS. It's it's great because it's easy. It's familiar. You're comfortable with it because you already know yep. what a VM is, but it's really not taking full advantage of the cloud. And I like how you're helping them take that next step into their journey and make sure that they don't just get to the cloud, but they get there in a way that they can start to modernize their applications and use telemetry yeah. to know where to make that good investment. Yeah, you know, what an example, if I may elaborate a little bit more sure. on, on why, because um, you bring up IaaS and, and cloud native and, and why we want to simplify that journey, not just to the cloud but in a, in a say a legacy model, but taking advantage of, of everything the cloud and also cloud native computing with containers can can bring to the table. I'd, I'd associate it with the pandemic today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the we all, high tech and, and technology always move very rapidly. But, you know, we went through a phase this year that, you know, really put that in hyperdrive of change happening in in ways that nobody could have anticipated or planned for. And, you know, the, I think the companies that are coming out of this the most successfully uh, or maybe the least, the most unscathed mm. um, are those that were kind of already on that journey and, and had the muscle memory starting to, to occur where they used agile processes microservices, containerization. So they didn't have to go through and modify, you know, massive legacy applications to say meet the customer where they need to be met. You know, if you if you think about, you know, contactless interaction, uh, you know, curbside pickup at not just restaurants, but you know, electronic stores, home improvement stores, every kind of interaction that you had with a customer had to be ad- adapted. And if you would have had to make all of those adapt adaptations uh, on a monolithic legacy application, 
Um, you know, I think those are the companies that we see, you know, that were closed for extended periods of time or may even be now closed permanently. Yeah, I understand. Uh, because they just weren't able. <laughs> Correct. They weren't able to adapt. And, and like you said, yeah. those that were already doing it, they just kept doing what they were already doing because they were thinking they're almost future proof. Yeah. Even pandemic, right? Because you could, re- um, they could respond to things that were unanticipated. Correct, correct. Uh, which is the kind of allows us to do in a, in a lot of special ways. One of the other things that I know a lot of people are starting to do, and I believe that you're investing a lot in AI and machine learning mm-hmm. to bring that to the cloud too, to help people with with maintenance of their infrastructure. Can you talk a little bit Absolutely. more about how you're using AI and ML? Yeah, some of the things we want to do to get some of the places we're starting with, uh, you know, to help our customers, you know, as people move to AI, there's this whole notion of AI ops, you know, how to, how do you turn the operations on and have an operations infrastructure uh, for your, your artificial intelligence applications and infrastructure for your machine learning. And what we really want to do is, is, is deliver an AI platform uh, that has None of the toolkits, the frameworks, the workflows essentially built into it so that, you know, from a customer standpoint, they don't have to necessarily go searching for which ones fit together, you know, which toolkit fits with which workflow. And then how do I tie my my data scientists into the workflow? So we want to help automate that entire estate uh, through an AI platform and an AI orchestration environment that's targeted at uh, you know the data scientists and really bringing the AI ops uh, members and the data scientists together in a, in a seamless fashion. Yeah, we're, we're I'm I'm excited about that because we're doing a lot of that too. We do ML ops here and AI ops. Mm-hmm. I, I lead the DevOps team at Microsoft, so uh, I hope you and I have an opportunity to work more together on that. And yes. figure out- ways we can bring that together. Brent, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with us today and sharing with us what SUSA is doing with uh, with Azure. Uh, it's mm-hmm. been a pleasure talking to you today. It's great. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Ubuntu is known for its openness and convenience in the Linux world. The rich community of tools, operating guides, and scripts are some reasons why people love using it for app dev workloads and hosting their web and mobile servers. It's the version of Linux that I run on one of my laptops. We have Nicholas Demotakis here, VP of the Field Engineering of Canonical, joining us today as our final speaker. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you for having me, Donovan. Could you share with us how Ubuntu is helping customers enjoy the benefits of Linux plus Azure? Sure, absolutely. Um, If you think of what we like to call the enterprise compute continuum, essentially this is compute across hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, bare metal, micro clouds on the edge devices. Ubuntu has one distribution across everything, bare metal, VMs, container-based images, uh, IoT devices like Raspberry Pi. That essentially allows developers to develop and then deploy across all substrates, of course, including Azure. In the modern world where workloads need to be sitting in all sorts of environments and serve uh, the end user in all sorts of different ways, this is extremely important. Uh, And the fact that we have one single distribution that helps us uh, do this without having a sort of like a a paid version and and a free version, but just a single Ubuntu version, is the reason why today 1.2 million machines get started for the first time every single day. Uh, Ubuntu is by far uh, the the most preferred operating system, especially in cloud today. Ubuntu, of course, is cost-effective, right? With a single distribution, um, you can just start any machine or or you can just create, build your container. Um, There is no license cost, essentially, right? So... The fact that you can um, run your CICD, start 100, 200 machines, turn them off, or run workloads on Ubuntu um, without any any effective license fees, that has been one of the big, big reasons why both startups and enterprises have adopted Ubuntu in such a significant way. It is optimized for Azure. We work and have been working with Microsoft for years to make sure that Ubuntu spins up and runs in the most optimized way 
in Azure, both on the IS side, but also on AKS uh, for containers. Uh, speaking about AKS, uh, you might not be aware that Ubuntu is the operating system for AKS workers in Azure. Um, and so obviously if, if people develop uh, containers under Ubuntu, that would seamlessly run on Azure's AKA services. Um, we've integrated uh, our own distribution of Kubernetes. We have two distributions, one called Canonical Kubernetes, uh, sorry, uh, Charm Kubernetes, and another one called Microcates uh, for, for edge and individual devices with Azure Arc. Uh, and so the latest version of Arc, which essentially manages fleets of uh, Kubernetes clusters across all sorts of different substrates works seamlessly with Canonical's uh, Kubernetes distributions. Uh, in Azure, uh, people can find Ubuntu Pro, which is uh, for enterprise use, that offers security and compliance. Uh, and we also offer, of course, support and managed services for open source applications. Uh, across a vast majority of workloads that would run perfectly on Azure. Very cool. Also, I, I used to be on the Azure DevOps team, and I know that our hosted build agents that run Linux are also in Ubuntu uh, agents as well. So they're running this exact same version. So I, I, I see it all over the place, not only inside of AKS, but inside Azure DevOps on laptops. It's just, it's been a really, really cool operating system for me to use. Um, Absolutely. Can you share a little bit about the design principles behind Ubuntu in the cloud and how it helps our customers build apps with ease? It seems like you've touched on some of that, uh, the fact that it's pretty much everywhere, but are there any other things that you might be able to add there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I broached the subject uh, a few seconds ago. Um, security and compliance is uh, for us number one priority for production workloads. Um, we brought out Ubuntu Pro, uh, which is uh, a, a version of Ubuntu that, um, with a small license fee as a as a tiny percentage of your um, hourly cost for running uh, VMs on Azure, uh, which enables security patching with SLAs across uh, a vast majority of apps that you can essentially download from Ubuntu's uh, archives, and also uh, a large number of, of compliance primitives. Uh, you can turn on uh, with a switch uh, FIPS compliance, you can run CIS hardening, you can uh, uh, run a DISA stick compliance if you're, if you're selling to the US military, for example, and so on and so forth. Uh, an extremely important point for us is stability. Uh, stability of, of Ubuntu and running uh, in the cloud, and of course, in all the other substrates that we were mentioning before. Um, and, and that has been one of the big reasons why Ubuntu is so preferred as a Linux distribution nowadays. Um, specifically for Azure, but also for other uh, other uh, substrates. Uh, we customize the kernel. Um, we have a deep integration with the Azure kernel. Um, and we ensure that uh, the performance uh, is exactly the focus uh, of those customizations, uh, together, of course, with, with all the security elements. Um, you, you mentioned this before, but the majority of innovation uh, from, from startups uh, to any sort of uh, large enterprise nowadays is mostly happening on Ubuntu. The reason uh, for that, apart from what we mentioned already, uh, is that there is a, a vast majority of tools, open source tools, uh, that the community brings out constantly focusing on all sorts of things, but uh, nowadays specifically on data science, machine learning, um, AI modules, and uh, of course, this is extremely attractive uh, to developers and eventually to enterprises that, of course, want to innovate fast. Um, the last point, I think, from a design principle that I wanted to mention is operators. 
Uh, operators seem to be one of the latest trends uh, right now, especially when you talk about Kubernetes, AKS, containers. Um, one of the things that uh, developers uh, and DevOps uh, people have realized is that when you build a complex application which is composed by multiple microservices, um, deploying it, putting it together is not very difficult. But operating it long term, which means scaling out that application, creating different relations between different microservices, upgrading the application, and running all sorts of other operational elements, software specifically operational elements. Uh, it's a very, very big challenge to do it with traditional configuration management tools. Right. And so as of late, uh, the concept of operators has become uh, a trend. Uh, and for a very good reason. Uh, and that reason is that operators are essentially ops code that is surrounding the microservice, which allow it to be deployed, to be related with another microservice, to be scaled out, to be uh, altered, and to essentially be operated long term. And so Ubuntu offers the largest collection of operators that exists out there in open source uh, because we've been doing operators with charms uh, since 2014. Uh, and so we've built all this experience and are now making it available for containers as well as machine operators. Great. So you mentioned developers in your last statement. Are there any best practices that you would recommend to customers that are thinking about building their application specifically for Ubuntu running on Azure? Sure. Um, some very, very high level points. Uh, make sure you build your applications uh, as cloud native, uh, 12 factor. Uh, you have to think in a, in a completely different way. Uh, make sure that you use open source uh, as much as possible for key components, uh, for your messaging, for example, Kafka, for databases, Cassandra, and so on. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes in these components. They are very transferable across different platforms, so that could be very helpful. You don't have to use containers for absolutely everything. It's important to understand that containers are valuable for specific functions, but not necessarily for absolutely everything. It might be easier to just lift and shift certain workloads. Uh, as I mentioned before, use operators, try to avoid scripting, and of course use APIs with your CICD, both for VMs and containers. No, I love the I love the way that you pointed out the fact that containers are great, but they're not the solution to every problem. And I have a lot of customers who over pivot there because everyone else is doing it, and it doesn't solve a single problem for them, but it complicates their scenario a great deal. And you can use Linux inside of a container, but you don't have to. There's other ways to utilize that platform for your success. So I really appreciate you you pointing that out. And I just also want to thank you so much for for hanging out with us today, Nicholas. Again, I'm a fan of Ubuntu. I use it myself, and it's just really nice to be able to to talk to one of our partners like you. So thanks so much for thank joining. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure.